<laughs> Hi, it's Warren Hewitt here. Hope you're doing marvelously well. I'm sitting here with my friend Bob. Bob Marlett, how are you? Hello, young man. Oh, I like, I like he calls me young man. This is good. And we're going to take a look at Bob's studio here. And we're going to talk music and more. Bob, we're going to put a little uh, all music list to Bob's credits. And you'll see that Bob has worked with some of the some of my favorite artists. And uh, we'll get to talk about that. And uh, thanks ever so much for having me over to the, where are, where are we? We're in Woodland Hills, aren't we? Yeah, Woodland Hills. It's the Blue Room is the name the, of the studio. Hence the blue. The blue room. But nobody noticed it's actually airbrushed. See, do you notice that? It goes from light to dark. Uh, it See? Does. Dun, dun, dun. So let's, uh, <laughs> let's talk about rock and roll. Right. Tidbits of information. Tidbits of rock and roll information. Yes. Yeah, and we're really blessed to be able to do this. Are you kidding? Yeah. Are you kidding? As a, you know, I, 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 it's funny when, because I'll be 60 in December. Right. And I've had people go, dude, you, you admit to your age? I can't believe you're I 60 said, for the way you look, to be honest. But. I, well, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> thank you. Um, and I said, are you kidding? It, we're so blessed to be mm -hmm. able to do what we do. And I'm like... I'm so happy at 60. Mm -hmm. You know, everything I ever dreamed of has come true tenfold. Yeah. So, hello. I was just, I, I was saying this to Connor on the way over. So we're driving over and I was like, oh yeah, we're, I couldn't remember what area. Where are we going? He goes, oh, we're in Wooden Hills. I was like, oh yeah, Wooden Hills. And I was like, you know, you're going to really like Bob's setup and you're going to like his house. And I was like, this is the kind of place that we all hope we'll get one day. Well, that's kind of, kind of what I'm saying is like when I was a kid I mean, and I sort of dreamed the you've dream. Got the pool, you right. know, you've got beautiful sized property. It's not too big, it's not too small, it's just right. But it's that, it's yeah. the dream when you're laying around as a kid and you dream of gear, you know, because right, right. anybody that knows our, our sure. kind of people, that... And, and it doesn't matter. I, at 60, I'm still like, I'll go to bed at night going, oh, wow. I should, you know what? Oh, I should go get that. I, I'll get one more Neve and then I'll get one more this. And it's like, you know, <laughs> and it, it never stops. It's like, oh, let me get another, you know, another Telly or another yeah. Les Paul or whatever. And it's like, but and that's, you, the, you know, it's the beauty. It's like, but the one thing actually I did do in, in, in a minute when you, you take a look around, you'll see that actually this is the completely pared down. This is me getting rid oh, it is? of tons of gear. Because I used to be like nuts. Like those refrigerator, you know, racks there. Yeah. I had eight of those. All oh, right. Just, you know, just ridiculous stuff. And then what the, the truth is, is that, you know, it's you like. You use two or three of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's exactly it. You got, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm looking at it. You've got a couple of classic Marshalls there. And then you've got some boutique. Yeah. You've got the wizard, which I, I know is great. Yeah. You've got a bog now. You got yeah. You've got yeah. we can go through them all. Yeah. yeah. You've got and and choice these, things. There's like tons of stuff sort of all over the place, but these are the things that sort. And every record, it it gets kind of sw certain things get swapped out. Right. Like we'll say, you know, on certain records. Uh, We'll, we'll lose the diamonds in, in right. comes high watts and, you know. And when you're working things. with the Sabbath guys, it's probably presumably all Laney's. Yeah, and, and it's, it'll be all Laney's and yeah. stuff. And, it, and it's like kind of that for every record. It's sort mm -hmm. of designed about, you know. And it's like all the pedal boards. They, even the pedals change relative to right. the artist, you know. Sure. Um, but th that's kind of the idea and the theory behind this room was to be able to be uh, quickly flexible enough so you spent all of the time being creative mm -hmm. versus like, oh, we got to take an hour now to reset up this and change this. It's like we on the uh, just on the other side of the, this wall, there's another little building over here that houses, we have, what, eight bays for, you know, four by 12s. Oh, nice. And then we have SVTs and a real Leslie. And, Wonderful. you know, we have all this stuff out there, which is so, and everything, this is, there's a patch bay in that rack there. Right. That, that allows us to, um, we can, uh, every cabinet, every head, every piece of everything is on patch points. 
So what you're saying is next time I'm cutting guitars, I should come over and hang out with you. Right. <laughs> Pretty much. Well, you, you know what it is. It's, it, it, again, it's designed over, you know, literally 40 years that I've been making records. Right. It's designed for... Um, just the ease and the comfort of making records. Right. Where it's like, you know, like I said, I want to spend my time going, ooh, let's shape the sound this way or do this or what's the part? Right. Here, let me see how you play in that part. Sure. Versus like, oh, we got to put another mic up and then we got to change sure. this. Right. So it's all about the quick ease. So right. literally in, in less than five minutes, mm -hmm. you have a stunning sound whether it's like a brutal heavy thing mm -hmm. or a really cool sort of artsy distorted octave thing or uh, how far do you go do you have different speakers and different caps yeah great yeah it, it and it again you know i just kind of know sure uh, out of my gear what works and what doesn't work you know acquired knowledge yeah that. it that's part of it it's mm -hmm. like you know and here's the funny one I, a little you know sort of a window into how I do stuff. I, my engineering is just simply a path to get to what I want for the song. You know, cause I, I started out as a keyboard player. You did? Yeah, that's what, remember Al Stewart? Of that was I played piano. That was one of my first big gigs when I was a kid. You played with Al Stewart. I played piano for Al Stewart when I was a little kid. You know, I was like nineteen, twenty, I, something like that. I learned I an Al Stewart song when the I was a little kid. The year of the cat. The year of the cat. Ding, ding. You played on that? Uh, I didn't play on that. I, I kind of I joined at the end of Time Passages, and then I did sort of uh, twenty four carats. I did the Time Passages sure. tour and the. 24 karat records in so on wait there. there. Stop the presses a second. So Bob Marlette, famous rock producer, <laughs> guitar, heavy rock producer, who's worked with my personal favorite heavy rock guitar player, Tony Iommi, who pretty much invented heavy rock. You've made Tony Iommi records, Black Sabbath records, and Ozzy Osbourne records. Probably the only guy that's made, been able Do to work with them individually and as a band. Yeah. Which is, says a lot about your personality. I was yeah. saying to Connor, and don't take this the wrong way, I said, you're going to love Bob. He's a big teddy bear. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and well, I just feel like, you know, you're such an easy guy to be around. You're so accepting of everybody. Which it's, is, it's and pretty, there you are. You work with Tony Iommi, Ozzy Osbourne, and yeah, Black Sabbath. Individuals, members, and a band. It's pretty funny because the amount of times that when young bands walk in mm -hmm. and they're like, they're like, what? You're nothing like what I thought it was going to be, because they, they were all like, you know, thinking that I was upside some down crosses. Evil, <laughs> you know, I was some, you know, was going to just like right. we rock. <laughs> you know, I, why isn't this room painted red? Yeah, that. I yeah. mean, it's just that was the thing. I just, you know, you got to remember, like in I never knew you were a keyboard player in the '80s. Like I played keyboard. I. Uh, I did Tracy Chapman's first two records. Wow. Wilson Phillips, Rick Springfield. I was actually in a band, uh, Tim Pierce, myself, and Rick Tim? Springfield. Right, of course. We're in a band together. Wow. Yeah. I yeah, didn't know so, the connection between you and Tim. Yeah. Well, t I produced Tim's first solo record. I think I knew yeah. that, but I just yeah. assumed guitar yeah. playing, you know, I didn't. Well, you know, Tim Tim and I, from the very first session we had together. We I think just, that is Tim's know, solo record. Yeah, I don't yeah, think, I don't think one, he may not have yeah, done another one. one but he's, I think he's probably working on one. I, you know, I just, Tim and I just like, from the very first moment, we just clicked and it was like, you know, part of it, I, I you know. My head's exploding. I didn't know any of this connection. Yeah. My first real band right. when I left home was, you know, it was Rudy Sarzo, mm -hmm. Frankie Benelli, wow, <laughs> myself. Right, we had we created this band. Actually, we put the band together in my parents' basement in Lincoln, Nebraska, and then and that's actually who I moved to Los Angeles with. Was uh, the three of us moved to L.A. together? So wait, there, stop the press. So you're from Lincoln, Nebraska as well. I'm originally from Lincoln, Nebraska, which I know is a little bit of <laughs> like what the you know it's. It is a little odd, but I, I, I... It's not odd. I think it's fantastic. I think this is this is really good because um, a lot of the theme of what we're trying to say, 
The wonderful thing about the good old interwebs, about the internet now, is like, I was talking about this the other day. When I was a kid, I knew this keyboard player was a couple of years older than me. And I'm sure you knew these kids. This guy could sight read, sight sing. You could put on a freaking Al Jarreau record and he could play along with it after mm -hmm. one listen. Mm -hmm. But all the whole time, I'm 16, he's 19. We're thinking, yeah, you're really talented, but there's some guy in LA who's like 10 times better mm -hmm. than you. Mm -hmm. You know what? I've been in LA now for a long time like mm -hmm. you have. I've never met a guy as talented as that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now we live in a world. Now you took it. I, I jumped on a plane from, from England mm -hmm. 20 years ago and came mm -hmm. to LA. You drove all the way from mm -hmm. Lincoln, Nebraska, 40, 40 almost years. 40 years, yeah, almost 40, uh, 40 years, yeah. So what's great about this world is we can just turn around and say, you know what, you can do it. You can get, you can be living yeah. in Nebraska or in a little village in England and you can actually make this your yeah. career. Because a lot, that wasn't, for a lot of kids, you just, we didn't think that. Yeah. My, my friend Nick's still back there playing at the local church. Right. Yeah. And he's still going to be, if he was here now, you'd be like, you're unbelievable. You could have been a professional musician. Yeah. I always have this. So I love your story. Yeah, it, you know, it's it's great because those are the things that make the lore of... And those know, guys are successful yeah, as well, yeah, which is even more yeah, amazing yeah, and, and wonderful. I, I, you know, I've always said that, the, the, you know, part of, the, part of the deal is being successful, in my opinion, has so much to, more to do with just personal fortitude right. and your ability to stick with it mm -hmm. and get up one more time than you get knocked down. Right. You know, because, you know, we all come out here, we all have the dream, but it's just, you know, when everybody else got tired and went home, mm. you stayed and you did what you did. Sure. And, you know, to me, it's part of it, I think, was that I, I, I didn't have a safety net. There was no safety net to fall right. into. Right. So it was so only... <laughs> It wasn't a parent yeah, with a it was trust or, fund. Yeah, or, yeah. You do or die, so, yeah. you know, and, and that there was something that, that was so great about that. And plus the other thing that I, that I really think is relevant too is the wonderful naivete of being young mm -hmm. and just simply saying, dude, I want to go do that. <laughs> you know, That's it's fantastic. like, yeah, I just want to go and dream that dream. You know, how, and then to achieve it to me is like, you know, what? so that's, that's why, that's, amazing. I, that's why I feel young at 60, you know, of course, I'm one of those believers though, you know, if you looked on the inside, you look, geez, he's 90. <laughs> you know, <it's> like, so, <laughs> yeah, because there's been a, a few A&R guys that have took some years off my life. Over the A and R guys, bands and managers. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, all of the above. All of the they, above. Yeah, they've taken a few years off the. Maybe you know. an ex-wife or two. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but that's a whole other story. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, no, I understand. Well, this is an amazing setup. I, I, I love the setup here. We can we'll do a little tour of the of the grounds and the house in a minute. But here we are in your control room, talking of the house. You have a screen here where you have, this is your dining room? Yes. And that's where you track drums? Yeah. It's got a reasonably high ceiling, and I think I'm saying obvious stuff here for, for you, but obviously the high ceiling is more important than the size of the room. I remember being in the plant in Sausalito a few years ago where they did some Metallica records, yeah, yeah. and the room was like tiny. Yeah. But you looked up, the ceiling yeah, was like yeah, 30 yeah. foot high. And well, it, it's what I, uh, earlier when we were talking about the townhouse mm -hmm. in London, that's kind of what I make the analogy that if you go remember townhouse two, right? It was just, you know, it was, wasn't big at all, but yet, do, 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 yeah. you know, it was the, you know, that's where, uh, uh, they did the, uh, Phil Collins stuff yeah, and a lot. Yeah. yeah. All stuff like that. And, and, you know, granted a lot of that was, you know, Oh, that, th that by the way is monkey monkeys, the studio dog. Maybe we'll see him a little later. Um, uh, th with the townhouse, it wasn't just the high ceilings. Right. It was the oddness of the angles. So there was never, there wasn't anything that was square. About, and that's part of it. When you look at it, there's like a, you know, a sort of kitchen dining room fireplace in mm -hmm. there and so there's brick, and then there's you know sure. uh, sheetrock, and then there's these weird angles, and the ceiling is vaulted. So right. that's part of what you know adds to the you know not having that boinginess and and you know, absolutely. It, it, 
And it was an accident, actually, because we, we were working on a, a, you know, quite a few, a long time ago, working on this kind of really cool little artsy fartsy thing. And, and, uh, uh, we were, and I was like, you know what? We need some like towel drums, you know, doo -doo, boo -doo, you know, kind of right. just cool thing. I said, well, let's just go in the room and, and put some mics up and see what it sounds like. And, uh, we did it. And I was like, you know, I put up room mics and I went, damn, listen to that. It sounds amazing. Right. So I was Happy like, the accident. Yeah, it was. And then I was like, wow, I wonder what it would sound like for a big crushing rock thing. So right. then we put a big crushing rock thing and then, bah, you know, it's slamming, That's you fantastic. know. Actually, um, the uh, I got a, a number one right now with uh, Red Sun Rising uh, on uh, on the rock charts, you know, which, right. ouch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in, inside joke. Yeah, it's yeah. like I got a number one. It's a rock chair. Oh, <laughs> so. yeah. I did the last Ace Freely rack album. We we got top ten in, in Billboard. Yeah, yeah, number one rock album. Yeah, it's like <laughs> yeah. I, I, I hear you. Thank you very much. Good yeah, night. Thank you. <laughs> it's yeah. like, but anyway, that that record. It's like when people listen to that record, they're God. The drums sound massive and, and it was cool. in there. And it was all in my dining room. You know. So now that's kind of become. Then I put tie lines. In well, talking of you know. let's, uh, talking of drums. So that's your room. What is your what's your mic priest? What do you what do you use on the drums? Uh, you know, it's it's almost always the the same. It's the Neves, right? It's the APIs. It's the I got a couple of uh, SSL channels there that were um, taken from an SSL and then you know sort of modded and then uh, the focus right. So it, you know it isn't much different than anybody else. No, that's good. The truth is, right, is that right. we all kind of make records with the same technology. 1073s and 312s. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's mm -hmm. 1073s, it's, you know, 57s, it's, you know, mm -hmm. uh, 1176s, la 28 It's kind of all the same stuff. Where we vary then becomes, uh, for instance, one of the things that I use is the Allen Smart. You know, and I use that as my stereo bus, you know, right. compressor. But then I, you know, it's like, as always, one isn't enough. So then we put the, uh, then at the final stage on Pro Tools, I'll throw in a, another plug-in to sort of, you know, mm -hmm. not so much compress, but just... To limit the top. Yeah, just bring the volume up so when people, uh, when they get uh, mixes, they're like... But this is really quiet. <laughs> yeah, like, I hear you. Well, you know, the problem is, is that, you know, sadly we have to, people forgot how to just simply turn it up. So we have to make it loud, ridiculously loud. I'm going to ask you a question and I'm not going to give you a clue and I want to see what your answer is. What's the best album you know to drive to? Hats. Hats. Hats by Blue Nile, the Blue Nile. I don't know the record. That's one of my all-time favorite records. Interesting. It's a really beautiful, it, they're a Scottish band. I know I know the band, I still yeah. remember the, the yeah. album. And Hats was my favorite, just like every song on there was just like, but it's not this kind of driving, it's old guy, oh. Okay, then it's if you're so going to do beautiful. this kind of this driving. This kind of driving. Um, you, know, you know this is a loaded question. Well, I mean, it's all, you know, I mean, you can never go wrong with ACDC. Yay! Just simply, you know? <laughs> just simply because, and... and ACDC, you just keep turning it up and it gets better and better. Well, and that's better. actually what I, was ab what I was about to say okay. was the beauty of ACDC mm -hmm. and the, the way they made those records is stunning. And part of it is that whether you're here, mm -hmm. like, eh? or you're there, <laughs> So good. Or you're in a football stadium, mm -hmm. and and here's the, here I'll tell you an interesting story because a couple of records I made back in the mid two thousands, early two thousands, are are these records that get played at every football game in America, every every Saturday and Sunday. Great, and it's beautiful. You know, thank you very much. I'm you know and all 
I, I love it. But the, the analogy that I'm using here is, is that I'll listen to those records and they're that, you know, you know, that kind of, you know, new metal-ish kind of, you know, heavy rock stuff. But sure. And I listen to them, I go, wow, that sounds really good. And then an ACDC record's on it, and I go, bingo. Yeah. Now that's the shit. <laughs> well, that's good. Like, that's self-effacing yeah. that you, you know, yeah. I'm the same way. We've got to be. We, yeah. we, we know where we're good and where yeah. we know our, our positives and our negatives. But, and it's, you know. But you, what reason why I mention it, and the reason is you, you had expectations when you made those records. You were probably like, no, 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 we need it loud. We need it slamming. We need it like square waved across the top. I, I, not so much. Right. But I, you know, the truth is I did get somewhat boxed in the corner when, you know, when you have the A&R guy and the, and the record company going, dude, can we make it just a little bit more crushing? And it's like, and the problem is, is they're not seeing it from that angle of like, wow, but if you leave it down just a little bit, you know, in the strip club, it's going to sound even better <laughs> when you, you know, when it's like blasting through there. So you just, you just went from piano player to guitar player. Then oh, yeah. You said that word. No, no, but, but <laughs> well, that's, I think, you know, I mean, honestly, that's, that's why I've been able to make records for 40 years is right. that I really am uh, whatever I need to be sure. in that moment. Right. And so part of my personality is a crazy rocker. Right. And part of my personality is this sort of sort of cerebral you know piano player kind of thing right. so it's you know and the great thing about being a piano player when people ask me about you know especially if it's like parents talking about you know what should my kid do i always say to them please if you can as speaking as yeah. a guitar player start, start with a piano <laughs> always start with a start piano. with the piano because yeah. 99 percent of the yeah. time it's going to be in tune especially yeah. of course if it's electric yeah. so you're going to develop good yeah. pitch you're going to understand yeah. melody yeah. and harmony you know, and for singers especially, yeah. more even more so than guitar players, it's realizing, <clears throat> excuse me, that vocalists, whenever you hear the great singers live, mm -hmm. they're all piano players, right? Right, with the great pitch live, sure. because they're piano players. You know, like you know, I always I always said that about. I remember seeing Elton John a long time ago, and and. I watched him play literally almost a three hour show, never saw one mistake, never heard a flat note, you know? Yeah. And I was just, you know, and, and, and guys like that just have that sensibility of like, wow, here it is. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I agree. We've got, I, I don't think there's much of a grooming going on anymore for that kind of artist as well. Now, of course, there's massive exceptions, Adele. Yeah. Obviously, she's one of those kind of artists. Uh, Sam Smith, those are guys, guys and girls that you know. If you gave them an acoustic guitar or piano, your hairs would stand on end. Yeah, and be like, yeah. But you know, we're in a different sort of industry now, which is very producer writer driven by guys building tracks and then singers writing mm -hmm. over them. Mm -hmm. So you know, that's just where we're at. Yeah. That's what's popular at the moment. Um, but yes, there's nothing more amazing than going to see an yeah. artist like that, where you you could strip away yeah. the band, you could put the band in. There's no secret my favorite band I talk about all the time is Queen. Yeah. And I was watching the, I think it's a Live at Montreal thing. Right. Where Brian's playing piano mm -hmm. on Save Me mm -hmm. with the guitar mm -hmm. loosely around right, him. Right, yeah, yeah. They're playing in front of 100,000 plus people. <laughs> yeah. He's got the guitar around him, he's playing piano, and then he goes to the guitar and Freddie moves in and sits down on the yeah. same chair and takes yeah, I know, and it's piano. like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But nowadays, it all be on yeah, Pro Tools files. Yeah, that, that's and exactly. And, and, and but but here's <laughs> here's an interesting thing that I've sort of you know come to over years because sure. I started out as such a snob. Right. I was a snob. I was an arrogant little snob. I think right? we all start like that. Yeah. But, well, it's true. I think part of, part of that is just simply Especially youth, if you you're know. technically into your instrument. Yes. I think yeah. it's part of the process. And, and that is. and Because I, I went through my, you know, all of my phases of my jazz period and all that sure. stuff. And, and so then you would see other artists that you would go, oh. That person can barely sing, or right. you know, what kind of song is that? It's only got two chords in it, mm -hmm. you know. And and it took me a long time to unlearn 
my snobbery sure. and get to the place where my reality is as a producer, my responsibility is to communicate the artist mm -hmm. to the people. Absolutely. And once I sort of, you know, because that's when I really feel like I became a really good producer. Right. Is when I started saying, it's not really about my sort of, my desire to paint this, you know, <laughs> you know, oh my God, look at this masterpiece that I've just painted, you know, sure. as opposed to saying, literally, my job is to take you, the artist, and get you to the people mm -hmm. and get it in a way so they can assimilate the information coming at them in a way that works for them. And that, you know, because like when I, whenever I go speak at, you know, some of these, you know, classes like, you know, MI and, and UCLA and wherever, you know, Berkeley and stuff, it's like, I always say, you know, it's, you, you have to be able to get the audience to understand metaphorically what language you're speaking. Mm -hmm. In other words, um, that's what allows me to, I think be, have the ability to d go from Tracy Chapman, Cheryl Crow to, you know, Z Rob Zombie or Black Sabbath or sure. Shinedown or any of the, you know, any of the sort of wildly different kind of things. Because at the end of the day, they're all the same. They're just music that's trying to get from here to the people. Right. And if you understand what it is and see it, you know, every band that comes and sits on this couch, right? It all starts with that conversation of what is it? What, what do we have here? And how are we going to get to the audience with your thing? Right. You know, and, and that's such a thing that's, you know, again, that's, accrued knowledge over absolutely decades of doing this because when i was 20 i didn't you know it's like dude let's just like wow let's make <laughs> you know right. and then as you go along you start realizing at the end of the day the you know the true job of a producer because I, I i remember having conversations with bands when they would come in and they would diss a particular producer that producer didn't do anything. And I go, well, wait a second. Now, did he not do what you thought he should do? You know, like when somebody sees me, it's like, okay, you play all this, you engineer, you write, you, you know, you do all of these hats. But the job of a producer isn't about all those hats. Some producers just hire, hire that guy, hire that guy, hire that guy. Producer's job is to get this to them. <laughs> yeah. You know, get the get the component to the audience. I often know? find with people who are not in the music industry and you're at a dinner party and they go, so what what does that mean? So you produce music. <laughs> and I usually find the only analogy that most people understand is when I say director. Because like a yes. director, I yeah. remember Tim um, um Tim Burton saying. He, and I, you can find this online. He goes, I wouldn't know a good script from a bad one. Mm -hmm. So he's not a guy that sits there and reads the scripts and gives actors like incredible direction on mm -hmm. when you say the words, you know, mm -hmm. he, he creates imagery. I mean, I'm sure you're like me, anybody. Tim Burton makes some of the most beautiful mm -hmm. looking movies mm -hmm. ever made. Mm -hmm. It'd be impossible to argue with that. And so he creates this incredible place for people to play and mm -hmm. have fun and acting. Absolutely. So that's one yeah. part of the job. Mm -hmm. And then you'll get Clint Eastwood, who's turned into an incredible producer, uh, director, yeah. sorry, who started off as a great actor. Mm -hmm. So he, not that I act, but my assumption would be, as a great actor, he talks to other actors right, yeah. and brings performances out of them that sure, way. Sure, yeah. So that's the way I explain production, because it's mm -hmm. exactly what you're saying. Some guys mm -hmm. will get in there and rebuild the whole song from scratch, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and other guys will find a way of getting the band to rebuild mm -hmm. the whole song from scratch yes. on their own. yeah. Exactly. So, you, I, I, so I get what you're saying. It's yeah, very the valid. producer's job is simply to get it done. 
Yeah. And However, it, yeah. However it gets done, yeah. he needs to get it done and make it happen. And and I think for me, I I learned all aspects in terms of engineering and playing and writing and right. all of those things, mainly out of, you know, a, a combination of certain things. When it was younger, it was a control issue that I had. Sure. I needed, oh, let's make sure every frame is perfectly, you know, you know, right. it's absolutely right. And if you can't do it, don't worry, I got your back. I'll, you know, right. I'll go play it or I'll figure out what to do. And then, you know, it's like, and what it's helped me, that has helped me more than anything as I get older and I'm more comfortable in my skin as a producer, being able to just say, it's okay. Everybody relax. It's right. going to be amazing. It's all good. Don't worry about it. Okay? Let's just make great music. Right. Let's go make great music. And, you know, it's all good. It, and if there's something that's not quite right, it's all good. We'll make it right. Right. So don't wait. And the, um, so many times with artists, all they need is that feeling of like, oh, it's going to be okay. Right. <sighs> And they look to us yeah. to be calm. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And and so if they look over and the producer's like, I don't know, no, no, no. it's exactly. And it's like that's not particularly a good place for the. I always tell <laughs> the up and coming engineers that work with me, assistants or whatever. I'm like, if something goes wrong, we'll deal with it. Yeah. If you make a deal out of it, yeah, that's far worse than something going wrong. Absolutely. I suppose uh, even though you're a keyboard player. <laughs> Uh, I love your guitar tones. Um, so do you have a go-to-ish kind of uh, pre for guitars? I'm sure you have a couple of options, but... Well, uh, kind of the system that we've sort of developed um, is essentially it, it lives within the Neves and the uh, focus right is essentially occasionally we'll get into APIs or, or the SSLs, but we try to keep it I personally like the Neve just a little bit more. There's just always something, you know, about it that just seems a little fatter and, you Absolutely. know, just it just works for for my ear. And and whenever possible, you know, I try not to EQ everything. A lot of times what I do is I replace EQ with multiple amps. In other words, right. I'll use a blend. I'll say, "Okay, my foundational sound may be Bogner, and then and then I'll add a little bit bit of the wizard in for a little bit of the lows, mm -hmm. to, you know, kind of fatten it up, but still. And then I'll have a bit of the Marshall in there for the poking out, sure. uh, you know. I and mean, yeah. so what we do is we, you know, over the over on this side we have all the amps and and and. Uh, all of the rooms or all of the little bays with the cabinets and stuff are pre-miked out there and they all show up in the patch bay. Do and you then, have different mics you prefer, 57s? And... I, I, I always laugh about with, with, with my peers, we have these conversations all the time when, when everybody's going, oh, dude, I just tried this mic or that mic. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. And then I go and buy that mic or, you know, try it out or whatever. And then I put it up against the ape, you know, the 57. And I go, oh, it's like 57, <laughs> you know. And then you, like, move it all around. You know, it's like oh, dead center. <laughs> dead center 57, Neve 1176. Thank you. Good night. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm with you. So, and, you know, that, ten, I mean, so 1073. 1073. And, and, ten, or 1081. Yeah. What, what I did was when I sort of got these, you know, as I said earlier, when I was trying to pare down and get the essentials, you know, because I, I used to be such a ridiculous gear nerd that, you know, I had walls and racks of stuff and then i realized i never turned it on so sure. let's just get down to well, what you turn I want. it on you know electricity bill was through the roof right <laughs> yeah well <laughs> you know part of it was in the old days you know you used to be able to bill back to the record company right. for having racks of stuff so yeah. like fly it out yeah yeah exactly we're, we're gonna need to fly it out you know so essentially it ends up being like i said you know uh 1073 1081. And the reason why I, I, I have those two 
is um, I'll, I'll make the choice when I listen to something. I'll make a choice, you know, wow, maybe this sound will benefit having, uh, you know, the 1080 or 1073 where it just needs a little bit of just, you know, the, the top band where you just, you know, you're just a little bit of top and it's shelved up and it's like, there you go, that sounds great. Right. Or you just want to, you know, and 1081 is more some, if I want to carve something specific right. in or out, you know. That's and I'm not, I'm not a purist about subtraction or addition right. in I EQ. Agree. I'm, I don't, it doesn't matter because I've always felt that everything in engineering has to be a per case basis. Sure. You have to listen to the sound first and go, what does the sound need? Does it right. need something removed from it? Does it need something added? Sure. You know, how to colorize. Because I hear, you know, people that are it's like, oh, I only subtract right. or I only add. I'm well, how can you do that? You know? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I, I, no, but I also, I think your point is incredibly well taken. Everybody I know that I talk to that, um, you know, does this for a living and has, has, has success in this business. I was just talking to Andrew Sheps the other day and, and, and he's like, he doesn't come out of the box when he mixes. He, mix, he records, like us, through mm -hmm. some nice pre's mm -hmm. with beautiful microphones. Mm -hmm. He prefers to stay completely in the box and not some. Mm -hmm. But then he's like... I, he goes, but one of my favorite mixers, and then he talks about another mixer, says he always breaks out, mm -hmm. and he makes great records. Mm -hmm. So what works for you, you know, is that's the... There you go. That, that, that's the it's, answer. It's how, it's how the information is processed in my head, and then how do I want to, you know, put it out there, and it's, you know... I, I don't know about you, but I find the guys that are most particular, but have varying different degrees of opinions of mastering engineers. Mm. Like we've we've talked to a couple of mastering engineers and some guys like you can only use this and I only use that and then this guy would be like going and I actually kind of appreciate that even if they have opposing ideas about what's right I believe it's it means that they're passionate about it mm -hmm. and they are very particular and very anal mm -hmm. frankly about mm -hmm. how to make something so you mm -hmm. when you you talk to a mastering engineer who's got really great ideas about what speakers and what power amps mm -hmm. and whether it's tube or whether it's solid state. I know that there's a guy who really gives a shit. Right, yeah, you know exactly, I mean? absolutely. Even if the other guy absolutely. doesn't agree. Absolutely. <laughs> no, no I, I, you know, I, what I do is I appreciate everybody's process. Sure. And every process is valuable yeah. to them in their process. And again, one of the things that's been incredibly important to me artistically is that I for the producers and engineers that do a certain genre, mm -hmm. and they do that really well, one of the things that's so important to me is like, I want to never be reproducing the same record over and over again. Right. I want it to sound different. So it sounds like, right. you know, when you listen to it, like, you know, when I did the last Leonard Skinner record, you know, I wanted people to go, that's Bob Marlette doing that? Right. You know, because, oh, I thought Bob Marlette did this. Sure. It's like, no, I, I, I want there to, you know, I, I, you know I, I attribute that some to the longevity of my career is that I have never been, you know, because I've lived through the, the late 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the mm -hmm. 2000s, and now we're halfway through the, you know, the 10s. So it's like... To me, the, the key, what's so important, is not getting too, I only do this. I agree. You know, because I, I and, and I respect and, and value somebody who has that style and is okay for them, but it, it's not okay for me. To me, I want to be in I agree entirely. I, I, I was just thinking, uh, I, I gave a, a talk at AES a couple of days ago, and afterwards... This kid came up to me and gave me a record. Great, great kid. And uh, I asked him what kind of genre it was. And I said, oh, I just worked with Black Veil Brides. And he's like, oh, cool. You know, have you worked with any other bands like that? I was like, no, this is the only, you know, I, I've done rock, Aerosmith rock, mm -hmm. Ace Freely rock, mm -hmm. and Black Veil Brides rock. I mean, they're all different mm -hmm. kinds of rock bands. He's like, oh, so you've only done 
you know that what it was almost like oh do i need a lot of credentials right you, you know <laughs> a you lot. gotta have like a bunch of a this bunch kind of, of yeah current yeah. modern rock yeah. bands it's yeah. like you know but to me is a, and, and no disrespect to him I'm, it was a valid question but i understand entirely what you're saying neil avron said some the same thing the other day and i think that you and he come from a very similar background neil was a I think he was a trumpet player. He, <laughs> you know, he like, went that. to jazz. And then, yeah, sure. But then he got his biggest, he, he was an engineer with uh, T-Bone Burnett. So mm -hmm. he's doing really mm -hmm. heavily organic one Right, like, yeah, yeah. Fairchild, yeah, sure, you know, the, tube yeah. compression, sure, yeah. you know, kind right, of sure. records. Yeah. And then his first success as a producer was with um, like Yellow Card, like Emo mm. Rock with a violin. Right, yeah. <laughs> so was he now, right, the, sure, was yeah. he now yeah. the emo guy? Yeah, yeah. You, you but, know. But, but honestly, you know, that's how I kind of got into rock because right. I never really was a rock guy. It just so happened I kind of understood. It was the hair. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was all the hair. It's like, you know, um, it, it, I, what had happened, I had made a specific rock record in the, in the 90s, in the early 90s. And it was kind of, you know, it was a kind of one of the early industrial kind of bands. Which, which record was that? It was a band called uh, Red Square Black. And it was with John Five and and you when know. he was John Lowry, exactly the pre pre Manson. So it was -Manson. John Lowry at the yeah. time. And um, I remember that time that and I had made this specific record, and then all of a sudden, you know, guys like John were like, "Oh yeah, Bob Marlette, he's this crazy fucking badass rock dude, right?" Sorry about the language. You can you know <laughs> chop that it's up. It's you want. okay. Yeah, <laughs> um, the. Then all of a sudden, everybody started going, oh, Bob Marlette, he's a rock guy. And then I got called for, uh, I did the Rob Halford record, and then I got the Black Sabbath Because John was playing with Rob in one? Two. Two. <laughs> you were close. You were only close. one off. Two, yeah. I can't remember the name of the band. <laughs> but, yeah, it was, uh, the, vo the album was called Voyeurs, and it was, the band was two. Two, that was. Yeah. And so... Uh, but that record essentially was just the three of us. It was just right. Rob, myself, and John. And so it uh, should have been called three. Yeah, technically, it should, <laughs> probably should have been three. <laughs> so, anyway, um, then uh, then I just started getting like then Black Sabbath and Tony Iommi called, and then all of a sudden, you know, and also? Uh, yeah, all that you know, yeah. it just all came out of that, mm -hmm. and I was like, oh, cool, I'm a rock guy. You know? By the way, if you do another Tony Iommi record, I I'll make coffee. Okay. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'll tell you a really cool moment on the first uh, Iommi record, the one I, the, the solo, the actual Iommi record. Um, we're in the studio. It was Dave Grohl, myself, and Tony. Tony had gone out to, to do something in the other room and and, and Dave turned to me and he went, dude, we're working with Tony <laughs> Iommi. You know? yeah. and, and, and I was looking and it's like, you, you know, he's, I, I love Dave Grohl. He's such yeah. a talented guy. And then to, but that's that thing where you're, you know, where you're just looking at it w with our young eyes, yeah. you know. And, and that moment for me was somewhat when uh, Brian May had come in oh, to okay. do, you know. And, and here's, <sighs> here's one of those moments that you, you can really relate to. So um, I'm sitting. All my hair's yeah, standing on end right. like the whole Brian May conversation. I'm, it's like, I'm at, uh, we're at Henson Studio B. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we're doing some guitar ideas and overdubs, right? I got Tony Iommi standing right behind me on this side, and I got Brian May standing right here. And having these two guys, hey, look, Brian, you're up there. Yeah. <laughs> these two guys looking at Bob. What would you like us to play? <laughs> you know, and I'm like. Dude, don't they know I'm just a kid from Nebraska? Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah. Freaking Brian May. Yeah, exactly. And that, it's just like... You understand a harmony better than any other human being, and you yeah. invented heavy metal. So yeah. It's like, it? hello, how cool... We can argue yeah. about who invented heavy metal. <laughs> it's like, but, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's just Oh, that, I know exactly that, what you're that, saying. That, you know. and, and I've been you know, pretty blessed for quite a few of those moments. Like uh, One of those was when I got to meet Paul McCartney. And, and hang out with Paul a little bit because I was producing Alice Cooper at the time. Oh, you were fantastic. I, I, yeah, I did, I did two Alice Cooper records. Wonderful. And um, uh, Paul McCartney, was, again, I was at Henson, and he was down the hall in Studio A with David Kahn. And um, 
I was in Studio B with Alice, but Alice, you know, wasn't there because I was doing like, you know, pickups and other, you know, fixes and things. And and I hear a knock on the door and, and he's like, is Alice around? And I'm like, I was looking down. I just come on in and I hear that voice. And I'm like, <laughs> breathe, breathe. Don't, don't say stupid stuff. You know, just all of the stuff that goes through your mind and just, and to his credit, he was the coolest, he, he's, nicest he's guy. He's going to be aware. Yeah. And, but that was, that's kind of what I, you know, when people ask me about that conversation, I said, are you kidding? He had to know. If he doesn't make people relaxed, and he'd never have a normal conversation with another human being. I, I love that story. It's, it's so good. I, I was working with this Hispanic band in L.A. years ago, like 15 years ago, and... They are like all Hispanic kids are, Latin kids are here. They love English, late 70s, early 80s. Oh, yeah, 80s. oh, yeah, yeah. And we were recording, and next door, the Bauhaus were rehearsing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Original lineup. Oh, how and We cool. came out, and the singer's sitting out, and he's having a cigarette, and he's like right. a 21-year-old kid. Right. He's sitting there with his backpack, right. backpack <laughs> and he's just sitting there. And Peter Murphy comes out, and this kid's like this. Yeah. <laughs> like, shaking. Yeah. And he's like... Hi, Mr. Murphy. Hi, Mr. <laughs> Murphy. My name's, you yeah. know, um, I can't remember his name, you know, Juan yeah. or whatever. And yeah. he's like, oh, I'm so, and, 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 and he's, and he opens up his backpack and he goes, I'm a big fan. And he pulls out like a Bauhaus record right. in his backpack to prove oh. that he's like a big fan. <laughs> I like love he's that. so, like the kid's so nervous. And Peter Murphy comes over to him and he's like, oh, you know, nice to meet you. And just immediately says this. Yeah. He goes, when I was 19, I was a huge Iggy Pop fan. And he tells him a story about going to the Chelsea Hotel in, in New right. York. Yeah. And going to the bar, and the bar during the day was completely dead and dark mm. and, and empty, except for what looked like an old lady sitting at the end. And he walks over to the end of the bar, and it's Iggy. Mm. Iggy with long hair, just kind of like, you know, over, right. a, over a whiskey. This <laughs> right. is back in the days you yeah. know, when yeah. Iggy was still partying. Yeah. And it's, anyway, he just told this story and just, he's basically mm -hmm. said, I'm just yeah. like you. Yeah, yeah. I'm just a fan. I'm just yeah. a, we're all just the same, you know. And it was so cool. And I remember being like, Peter, you're the coolest freaking yeah. guy in the world. You know? But see, that's what's so cool is the dudes that understand how it is. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, we were the kids, then we're the adults, and then we talk to the kids. And, it, you know, that that's kind of what I was saying about how important it is right now at this point in my life to put back into the well that I've drank from for so sure. many years. And and that's really such an important thing. And Can you we, imagine you when know, the Beatles met, met Elvis? They must have been like... Mm. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. That's the yeah. beauty. And and one of the coolest thing that Paul said that I just i have never forgotten, he had the most amazing... Because at the time, his, the number one, the Beatles' number one's record was number one. Oh, wow. And I said, oh, by the way, congratulations on another number one. And he thinks for a second, he pauses and he goes, you know, it's funny because I hadn't listened to a lot of that stuff in years. We actually wrote some pretty cool songs back then. And he was dead serious. Dead serious. Yeah. He was dead serious because to him, that was yeah. his band when he was a kid. Wow. Because remember, that was this period of time in his life. Yeah. It was this period of time. Yes, it affected everything in his being. But, That's amazing. And it was so beautiful. And I literally, it almost brought me to tears because it's like you're watching the beauty of just what it is we do. We just make music. We love what we do. We're passionate about and we make music. And that every day, we're so blessed that we get to do this, you know? No, it's wonderful. And I bet you're going to agree with this point and probably have an even better point. But when I was working with Aerosmith, Stephen, insanely talented, run around, hit things, play piano, mm -hmm. try a drum beat out, sure. do backgrounds, whatever, you know, he's insanely talented. At the end of the day, after he had outworked everybody, I'd always be like, great work today. And he'd be like, thanks, man. And because I realized... When you're in that sort of echelon of, mm -hmm. you know, superstar, people don't actually tell you you've done a good job. No, it's a, it's kind of, it's every, like, you, you sort of assume that they realize yeah. that, yeah. you know, you're Paul McCartney, yeah. you're a genius. Yeah. I don't have to say you did a good yeah. job because yeah. everybody knows you're amazing. Yeah. But, they're just but we're all human, human and like, we feel the humanity. Yeah. yeah. I, I couldn't agree more, you know. And it's true when you, when you speak to some of the iconic figures like that in 
those human terms, it really, it's, it's amazing how endearing that becomes, you know. Oh, it's amazing. I, yeah. I just want to talk to you about Tony Iommi for the next five hours, but <laughs> it's not, the, not it's, we'll reserve that. So are you using the dangerous for summer? Yes. Great. Um, but it's, it's, it's a combination of things. It's uh, the bottom one is actually the uh, guitar mixer. Oh, so, so that's all the input. So I, I put them all in there nice. and then I can just sit here and blend and create, you know, Flip the phase. I see yeah, that. Exactly. So, you know, it allows me to, cause that's the biggest issue when you're running multiple amps and stuff is, is the phasing issue, you know, Great. and that's why I, I'm toying with the, you know, I'm going to try this soon of going and trying, um, having some, four by 12s built that only have one 12 in the center, mm. but you have the weight of the cabinet, Same but you have, minute, yeah. yeah. So it's like, and try, I'm, I'm experimenting and, and I'm trying to, you know, get people way smarter than me to help me figure this out, but I'm trying to lessen the effect of um, uh, phasing issues and stuff mm. like that within, you know, all the multiple stuff. but. But, and then I get, you know, some guys tell me, it's like, dude, the way you mic it, it doesn't matter because you're, you know, you're right on the cone there. Right. You're not getting a lot of, you know. But the one thing I do have that I did have to work with a bit having bays is there, uh, I have closed bays and I had to really work quite a bit to get it so you didn't get that r r quick reflective back into the, remember when the, you know, sure. the speaker, if it's something's too close, it just comes right back. And then the mic picks up this weird coning, yeah. you know, tone. So I had to, you know, work quite a bit to get it. So it didn't do that, that it was just, you know, dead. And, it, you know, it's, the thing is, is that sometimes I'll bring the, the amps in there if I want a particular tone. So, that's the beauty of this environment. I can just kind of, you know, do whatever I want. But um, so yeah, the first one is um, is the mixer. Then the uh, second one is essentially, you know, one through eight of Pro Tools. So that's essentially my. It's a breakout for drums, oh, I so see. I can you know have individual control over drums. But yet I don't really ever touch. It's so rare. And the only time I really touch it is like if I'm in the final stage of a mix and I want just a little bit more kick or snare or whatever, then I'll just go like that. But I try to resist that because then, you know, if I need to recall, like, oh, shit, I forgot. I won't touch it. it. Was, I, yeah. No, I understand yeah. what you're saying. So. Dumb questions. Are these transformers in every single one of these? Yes. Oh, okay, so yeah. every channel is a transformer. Yeah. Great. That, that I mean, I, I kind of went to Dangerous simply because... Um, did you, do you know Paul Logos? Mm -mm. Oh, okay. So. Paul Logos is a wonderful mastering engineer in New York. Right. And, um, I think it was the tech at Sterling mm -hmm. when he left Sterling, he's the one that created dangerous. Oh, I see. So it's, you know, and, and I'm easily swayed by, you know, clever tech weenie dudes that, you know. Yeah, you know, if they and mastering tell, guys are always those yeah. guys. They, yeah, exactly. They they're, 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 so yeah, so they're very anyway, eccentric. Yeah, Paul and him are, are partners and stuff and other things. And and I use Paul a lot for a lot of my mastering now. Right. I, I'm a real fan of his. He's done like my last, you know, five or six records or more. So, and then uh, what's this two bus? That's here? that's essentially nine through twenty four. Oh, I see. Yeah, and that's just you know static. So, and so you uh, can go. Stereo in or split mono, I see. Yeah, you. Okay. yeah. And then the last one here? And then that is just essentially just to control, you know, four headphones into the other oh, room. I see. Oh, great. And the speaker, you know. Oh, and, I see, yeah. And then I have a, I have a separate speaker box over here because I have my sub on a foot switch. So. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, you know, all my speakers I can listen with or without sub. And then, uh, and then that's my speaker switcher for you that. and I are pretty identical, old school LA, which is General X and NS10s. Yeah, yeah. Um, those are 1031s, are they? Yeah. And then, but I don't know the PMCs. What can you tell PMC, me about those? PMC. What I was looking for, I, I wanted something. You know how there's certain speakers that are just so brutal 
they're just like, you know, it's impossible to make it sound good on them. Almost NS10s. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> but NS10s are different. NS10s are actually easy because we've been working on them so many Forever. years. We know the curve. We know what it is. Yeah, my, but my it, thing, I, I don't know if you, my thing with NS10s is to say that if a guitar sounds offensive and a snare drum sounds offensive, yeah, on NS10s, you, you're, so you're just about right. You're about yeah. right, yeah. It's funny because I, 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 um, I, uh, Bob Clearmount mixed a couple of my songs. Well, we we were working on a, a project together, and and it was just he was just mixing a couple things for me, and and uh, I said to him, you know, one afternoon just hanging out, I said it's your fault, right? And he goes, what? You know, kind of. What? I said it's your fault. We're all sitting around using NS tens, pretty much. <laughs> It's like, because we were all like, you know, well, Bob Clearmountain uses them. <laughs> and it it's must like, be good, yeah. and, and he goes, well, dude, it wasn't my fault. They just brought me some and I get, you know, I used them and I got used to them. <laughs> and it's like, as always, when you find out the reality of a story, it's like, sure. yeah, because, you know, because we all had visions of him, you know, doing, you know, sonic tests and like ping tests going, yeah. this is the perfect speaker for yeah. this because it responds. Sure. And it's, you know, well, and every great, or, you know, producer, engineer, whatever. And then you find out it's like, oh, that's what I had and that's what I got used to and that's what I do. And which is, I think you just you just summed it up. That's what you're used to. Yeah. And I think if if somebody's used to yeah. a pair of Mackie speakers and makes great music on it, then yeah. God bless it. You, and, and, and sorry, because I don't want to go on a soapbox here, but sometimes no, no, I, stuff. I get I get frustrated because and, and this is because a lot of people ask me, you know, how come you started mixing your own records? You know, mm -hmm. because. It's not like I don't like to mix, but it's not my favorite thing. Mm -hmm. Mixing isn't necessarily my favorite thing, but I got kind of good at it and I just sort of just started mixing a bunch of my own records. More than anything is I always felt one of the problems with contemporary you know, music today is we, we started, if, if you think back about it, um, Zeppelin didn't sound like Pink Floyd, mm -hmm. and Pink Floyd didn't sound like Black Sabbath, and Black Sabbath didn't sound like the Who. Yeah, yeah. and the Who didn't sound like a Deep Purple. Sound. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, whoever. Yeah, everybody sounded different, mm -hmm. and part of it is because we didn't really have mixers back in the day. Sure, we had. You know, the producer would hire a mixing engineer, but he would be it was his responsibility to say, here's how I want it. And well, usually it was the engineer just finished mixing. Yeah. The well, that, that a lot of it was that it's just like, okay, we're done tracking. All right, finish it up. You know, it's just sort of balancing it out. So everything just was balanced. Mm -hmm. And there you go. That's why they remember back in the Beatles days, that's why they called them balancing engineers, sure. you know, cause that's oh, essentially yeah. what they did was just, they just balanced it I mean, out. You correct know? me if I'm wrong, but I, I think it's recently they started adding real credits to Beatles records. Because I know when I was a kid and I was looking at old versions, original 60s albums, you'd flip them over and it would have the Beatles produced by George Martin. Yes. That was it. Yeah. You didn't know who was playing the harpsichord. You yeah. didn't know who the string players were. You didn't know who the engineer was. Everybody was invisible because it was invisible. just simply, yeah, but, but times have changed times where, changed. you know, we have a desire for you know, minutia. <laughs> yeah. We're all like, oh my God, what was this? What, you know, what but then, was that? Then again, you see, that's Bob's to blame for that too. You know, Jack, Jack Douglas told me that he was in, ooh, I'm terrible remembering which studio, but it was a New York studio, probably the record plant. Could have been the power station, but I think it was the record plant. And he was in, I believe, in one room with Aerosmith and uh, Bruce Springsteen was in the other room. And they were both going on a long time. The Springsteen record had been going on a little bit. And Bob had a room upstairs. This is me oversimplifying, mm. so don't quote me exactly on this story. And he comes down and says to them, you know, you guys are here a little behind in the, in the record. Why didn't you give me a few tracks to mix so that you get caught up and you can turn them in? And they're like, oh, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. I mean, that's an mm. approximation of the right. conversation. Right. But he started mixing the Springsteen record before they finished it. And then suddenly a mixer was born. Yeah. An yeah. external mixer. Right. And, yeah. And then it became the, and part of it was the, then it was continued by 
A&R guys because A&R guys, well, who did that? That sounds like a hit. I want my record to sound like that. Sure. And then the process just was born and then that's the way it was. And then, I, you know, I, I remember, because uh, I started mixing records before I knew what I was doing. Because I, I literally was you like... You mean you know what you're doing? Because I'm clueless. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. Well, let's not get carried away. Yeah, you exactly. know? <laughs> right. If you know what I mean. It's like, yeah. Because yeah. I am a big believer. And it's like, you know, when, when people ask me, what's your favorite record you've ever made? It's always the same line. It's the one I'm about to do. Yeah. Because exactly. I'm going to get it right That's on this idea. next one. I like that. I'm going to use that. Yeah. Because it's always, you know, yeah. it's like, dude, at the end of the day... You know, there's never a record where you don't go back and go, even in the most brilliant, like hugely successful records, you go back and go, God, man, I could have had the snare sounds just a little too papery there. Or, wow, the kick, you know, the kick could have been a little deeper. Any right. number of things. There's always stuff, you know. Right. Sorry, I digress. I no, was, no, no. I, I, think, I, know, I think that's great. I, <laughs> I, I, when uh, Chad Atkins died, in the uh, LA Times, they ran his obituary, of course, and, was, and uh, I don't know. I'm not really a newspaper reader. I'm more I read stuff online and BBC or whatever. But I had the LA Times, and I know what I was doing, and I was flicking through it, and I saw the obituary, and there's a picture of him, and it just says, "I believe he has the most amount in country, but he has the most amount of number one singles, number one albums, the most number one you know productions, mm -hmm. co-writes." Mm -hmm played on i mean mm -hmm. his accolades were yeah. insane yeah and then so they it were chad atkins you know famous guitar player songwriter producer blah 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 lots of stats and then at the bottom they said when interviewed in 1997 chad atkins said what do you uh, so he was asked sorry what do you attribute your success to and he said and this, this is the quote and why i cut it out he said i've never been happy with anything i've ever played or recorded i've never found a chord substitution that works better than the original chords i've never found a melody that's stuck in my head for longer than the, just a whole yeah. just bunch of like i'm yeah. never happy yeah yeah well i you know it's it's i've i've had to learn though and and i'm sure it's the same with a lot of people it's like when when a fan comes up and it's like oh my god that record changed my life that and, you know and you're like oh my god you're the you know and it's like you have to learn how to just say thank you because for right. the longest time i would go we yeah, have but you know i you know and and i would i would i was sort of you know always brutalizing myself that I should have, you know, and then somebody, you know, I, I, and it was, I forget who said it, but it was brilliant. It was just, dude, just say thanks. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. And that, that's because as you. a fan, yeah. I, I understand you're, you're giving them the, you're, you're, you're yeah. validating, you're validating them experience. being, yeah, it, it's their experience. You know, it's not about your experience, about their experience, yeah. you know? It's so I can see you have what I would say, all the essentials and more. <laughs> well, the, these tend to be some of the, the, the more generic ones. And then we have uh, lots of really cool other things, but uh, they sort of get brought in a case-by-case -case basis. Right. Actually, one of my, my new favorites that I've sort of recently discovered is the, uh, the Cornish Petals. I don't know the Cornish pedals. Tell me. It's Pete Cornish was uh, Brian May's guy. Oh, you're correct. And yeah, he's course. the guy that created uh, the boxes for Brian May. Oh. Wow. And it, that pedal right there is magical. Is it treble booster? It's a 30 dB 3K boost. Wow. You know, but it's on a pot. They make another one. The uh, t uh, was it the TV uh, 83. I forget the number, whatever it is, but it it's just literally a boom, 30 dB boom. This one has a, you know, a, a, a attenuate so you can pull it down if you want and blend a little bit. And, and uh, so that's, that's a treble booster times a okay. gazillion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a gazillion times trouble. That's amazing. And it's brilliant because it just, you know, it just add. you know, when you hear in those old recordings that kind of the you know the kind of cool scrape on the string that just makes that come alive you know wow. yeah it's pretty spectacular and then the uh mxr um 
That's a new box that we've uh, got in here, which is an octave fuzz box. Wow. And it's just really cool for a lot of real dirty kind of, you know. Huge guitar. Yeah, just cool stuff. And, Wonderful. And then a bunch of the, uh, the I haven't other used stuff. the feedback booster. Does that get used much? Um, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't want to be negative on stuff, but it's, it, all it does is just exactly what, yeah, that's okay. exactly what it does. Okay. You know, and you get stuff thinking, oh God, I wonder if I could do this and this, and then you get it and you go, Deek. it's like, yeah. all right, fair enough. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> it's right. like, yeah, I, it does what it does. You know, Boss makes so many great pedals. They're, they're, it's okay for them to make yeah. a couple that aren't that yeah. great. <laughs> but, but you know what? It's, it's like even, even, cause these, I consider some of these to be a little bit more, sort of normal run of the mill kind of stuff but th sometimes that's what's needed in it so yeah. you just you know I love the holy grail I mean I Oh the holy grail is great I think it's really cool too yeah. for you know it but I tend to use it more just for those cool single line alternative -y kind of sounding things sure. it's really cool Actually what's really cool too is the the vintage uh bass head here Oh the ampeg yeah the, yeah, the old ampeg it's you know the that thing's really cool and we have it a in the other room, an 8x10 cab out there, too, that's really cool. And the BF2, I love those. Uh-huh. So, yeah, so it's a little bit of this, a little bit of that, you know. Memory Man, Phase yeah. 90, of course, for the You can never the Van go Halen. And a Phase 45. Which I don't know that much. I've used only one time. Yes, Phase 45. I actually got it because uh, um, I was working with... Uh, uh, I forgot I'm blanking on his name, the guitar player for Hoobastank. And he was, and I, we were talking about a, a, one of their big hits. And I'd kind of really liked the sort of real clean, kind of, you know, smooth phase. And I'm like, because that's too soft for it to be a 90. What right. did you use? And, oh, that's phase 45. So then I went out and got it because it was like, I, I sometimes I do that just on when I'll hear somebody. It's like, oh, yeah, they used that on that. And I'm like, oh, cool. Let me go check that out. And you have a small stone, which is yep. also another great yep. phase. Yeah, that's a really good one, too. Yep. And, uh, I, you know, I, I really like this guy, too. The, the Memory Man. The Memory yeah. Man. And, and, but I also am a fan of the, um, the Super Puss, too. I think the Super Puss is also, you know. Oh, the... Um the, the yeah the the MXR super puss the delay it's a delay and oh right right core, but it's the the delays that I like are always the ones that have some form of vibrato chorus on the delay because <coughs> to me it's always about the sound it's like it's the note and then it's that sure <laughs> the feeling of that you know right. and that you know to me because even like when i set up my delays you know in pro tools uh i'm a you know i'm an echo farm right you know i use echo farm for everything echo that's why i stayed in you know uh i stayed in 10 right you know because i never made the move because oh is echo farm not supported no not anymore Ooh. yeah no i know that's why i, I was Ooh. like and it, I, I use it, but I use it in a stereo configuration. Right. So it's always about having all, almost all my delays have, sure. unless it's a, you know, in other words, it's if you're using a specific dink, 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 where you need a, right. you know, repeat or something. Well, you but, want to do like an yeah, edge guitar. Exactly, yeah. where it's a, dee -dee 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 -dee, you know. Yeah. But otherwise, I, I really like the, the, you know, because it just puts, you know. The random, the kind of yeah, modulation. Dimension. Yeah, and it's so. all about the the width and you know the float of it. So I, I love that old flange there, the ADA. Yeah. Oh, that thing's killer. Yeah, that's that so cool. I, I think uh, I think Linda had one of those when we interviewed her. Um, wow. And now your guitar collection is pretty wa wonderful here. They've got the baritone. Oh yeah, that. I that's if if I'm if I if I'm to give up any trickery. Yeah, that is one of my tricks for, for, fanning up for guitars. heavy guitar tones. Yeah, is a medium clean baritone in the middle of super heavies because all of a sudden there's this there's some solidity, clarity, yeah. and point. You know, so that when you get them, when you get stuff on the outside, it just it just makes you it go put it out. Do center or do you do one left, one right? A little left, right. Right, right. Yeah. And it's mostly so the guitars on the outside can uh, hold their imaging better. Right. You know, and that's by, you know, or 
doing like a weird octave -y kind of thing to that to get it even more kind of ugly and distorted and, you know. But again, it's like, to me, it's like, it. it's all about defining your space as always in sure. every record, defining the space, saying, okay, this thing is all about having just this ugly, dirty center distortion. And then you have smaller, cool peripherals right. or this is a record that needs just super wide heavies all the time. Right. You know, it's just saying what what's the animal, what right. needs to happen for the animal to be great, spot on. So that's wonderful. It's funny how there's certain guitars that people gravitate to all the time, and then there's guitars that I gravitate to all the time. I would probably go between the Tele and the Deluxe. Oh, those two there. That would probably be my, yeah. that's the world I live in. The magic, honestly, the magic is right here. It's in this doo -doo 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 yeah. right there. That is a baritone telly. Oh, it is. And that thing is just, that's, oh, yeah. been, on, that's been on so many records. Oh, wow. Um, I, I, the, the, uh, one of my favorites. Uh, so if I grab it? Go, go for it. That's, I always say, it's like, that's what those things are for. Oh, yeah. You know, it's just, it just, the next beast, <laughs> it's like the next beast, and it's not really meant for lead. It's only meant for kind of, you know, riff based heavy stuff, but it holds oh, wow. its tuning like you can go G, low G on it, and, you know, all the way down, and just like, you know, it gets heavy and badass and holds its tuning, you know, it's crazy. all the way down. So, uh, that guy gets, and uh, um, if you remember that song by Seether, uh, Back to the Remedy. I do, yes. That was that, was that and the gold top. It, wow. it, it's what My favorite is the gold top, because that's a 69. And that thing is just one of those, because it's an original deluxe. Yeah. It's not even a standard. Right. It's a deluxe that's been rerouted and <laughs> messed with. And, wow. and I got it, and, and I was like, this is the fattest, heaviest Les Paul. Wow! I, you know, and it. But, but my favorite is when other go dudes bring their Les Pauls. Yeah, but check out my Les Paul. And I'm like, okay, cool. That's right. great. That sounds good. Uh, just, just let's A B the two. Let's just you know pick up the Goldie and listen to what it yeah. sounds like. And then they pick up the Goldie. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> it just like, looks beautiful. It's just monstrous. And that Telly is just you know. And the 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 blonde telly there is just a just a beautiful yeah, guitar. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, that looks yeah. like the place to live. That, I mean, my yeah. I have a gold top and I love it. Mine's mine's a uh, an anniversary model, an eighty five, and it's a right. B stock. Back yeah. in the old days, where if they had oh. a dent, they would just sure, yeah. be on the back because yeah. it had yeah. a dent. Yeah, but <laughs> but but that's totally cool because I you know it's like I. I my guitars are not for collectors. Mm -hmm, exactly. They're to be played. Yeah, the same okay? thing. Yeah. I want people to grab it, play it, make music right. on it. So all the guitars here are really more about, is that going to get me a sound that sure. I think is cool that I'm going to dig? I'm like, the same way. I, I, I have some really random ones. I know. I have the same guitar. Yeah, but yeah. that's a, that's a, uh, Jerry a 68. Oh, that's a yeah. real one? Oh, no, that's a real guy. Oh, that's yeah. a real one. Yeah, that's a oh. for real dude. Yeah. Oh, mine's a yeah. Mine's a Jerry Jones. Looks exactly the same, but I didn't yeah. see the headstock. No, no, no. This oh, is. Oh, yeah. This that's the now real. Now we're talking. Yeah. Yeah, that's the real deal there. <laughs> I love that. It, it's funny because I I, I always joke with people because that makes it on almost every single record. It does. I've yeah. never found a place and, for mine. And, Tell and me more. Because, it, it, but it's more like a gag thing. Oh, I see. <laughs> you know, it's just like because it has to in. So there's always a spot for it, even if it's just going. You know, dinner, dinner, dinner. You know, it's like just the simplest thing. There's, it's almost, it's on almost every record. It's some, even if it's a note or two. I just, <laughs> I just got to have it on there, you know. I didn't know. Looking at yeah. it, I just assumed it was a reissue. Oh, I didn't no, know it was no, just, that's oh, it. Wow. And, and, and it's only there because of my love for Yes. Because oh. when I was a kid, because I bought it in 1972, I think. Oh, you probably paid right. nothing for it. Then. Right. No, I, did, I got it for almost nothing. And, oh. and, and, and it was partly because... Uh, um, and it's now worth a fortune. The, the guy that I knew owned the, uh, I knew the guy that owned the music store. 
And, you know, we were really good friends. And he was like, you know. Um, Vincent Bell's signature. Yeah, because I'd, I'd seen uh, um, Steve Howe use it on, you know, and I'm like, I got to have that thing, you know. So I literally, you know, went and had the guy go hunt me one down and I got it. Yeah. I love, I was going to say a, a, a second ago, I, 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 you got the lipstick pickup Ibanez here. Yeah. Um, you know, I, there's a Jennings here. Yeah. I, I, Fernandez. This, this, this guy right here is such an underrated guitar. Oh, I can it believe it. It sounds and plays so well. Right. And I actually got it by accident. Right. Because uh, one of my really close friends is John Five. And uh, John had that. And right. it was like, he said, I'm never going to use this thing. Here, you take it. Right. And so I was like, all right. So I just, and, and then I put it up on the wall and didn't use it forever. And then one time somebody said, oh, let's try this, that for the, for the yeah, lipstick." What, what does right? that one sound like? Yeah. yeah. And then we put it up and I was like, geez, all this time I should have been playing. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, Not it's the same really way. great. Yeah, really the, great. Yeah. I was going to say the same thing. I, I have a couple of Yamaha Pacificas. They cost $699 yeah. retail. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And they have Seymour Duncan pickups yeah. in it. One has a P90 in it and a Seymour Duncan humbucker. And it's like I pick it up because they have different pickup configurations and I yeah. plug it in. And I start playing, and then yeah. I look down, and I remember I'm playing a $600 guitar, but I'm hearing an amazing guitar yeah, sound. Yeah, and it's cool, so... So who gives a... It doesn't matter how you get there, so long as you do. Yeah. I'm very lucky, because a very good friend of mine is Bob DeMarco. Right. Bob DeMarco has written all of those TV shows. You wonder, who wrote that, right? Oh, like, like, extra, extra, you know, yeah. and that, and Current Affairs, and all sure. those. Like, he wrote all those jingles, but now he kind of retired, and he lives out in Camarito, but he collects everything. I, I, I think I'm convinced he just sits around at home and on eBay and just like, <laughs> buy, <laughs> buy. <laughs> he just <laughs> buys endless stuff. But... It's like any time I want anything, like whatever it is, the weirdest, like I really want like a, you know, that, that 60s Ampeg, you know, one they used on Cherish, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, I got that, <laughs> you know. So I drive out there and I just, you know, I load up my car with whatever weird thing I want because he's got so many cool things, so. That's amazing. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, having people like that where you can go in and go. Oh, it's Because the they'll know, yeah. like, what is this? Oh. Yeah, exactly. Because that's what you get is like, oh, dude, yeah. let me tell you. Let me tell <laughs> you. Like, like, yeah, yeah, tell me. I yeah, want to know. Exactly. Yeah, I love it. I know. That's, I love that. Making records like that with that creativity is so much fun. It's amazing. And yeah. then, well, we could do guitars for hours because there's so many great yes, ones. But let's slap but... over to some amps over here. Uh, Real so, nice. yeah, the, the idea in this uh, of, of our amp situation is what we have is we have a patch bay here. Right. And uh, in the patch bay, the heads and the cabinets, okay? So, Great. Uh, um, so you can patch any head into any cabinet. So if you wanted like the Bogner to go to the Vox cabinet out there, you could, you know, oh, nice. or you could take uh, the Vox or the Fender head into a Mesa, you know, Mesa 4x12, you know? Wonderful. And so it's really cool because it, it, at a moment's notice, you just go, let you know, let's try that or right. swap cabs or, you know, so we have different, like, you know, we'll have a, you know, uh, a, you know, an old greenback and then we'll have a, like a vintage 30 or, a, you know, a 75 and we'll just have different, you know, kinds of cabinets and we go, oh, let's try this and That's see wonderful. what happens. Yeah. And then you just sort of mix and match whatever head you want. And, and then uh, this row here, it, you know, it's funny, I just kind of started changing over because these were just completely full of pedals and things. And then they were patched, you know, you could get whatever patch point for oh. any particular pedal or stuff. The problem was I realized it was preventing guitar players for being, from being more interactive and connected to the pedal board. The second I went to a pedal board, guitar players are like, oh yeah, dude, here, wee, wee, yeah. you know? Yeah. And it became much more interesting. Tactile. And, yeah, exactly, yeah. tactile, perfect yeah. word. Because yeah. that was it. They were making the visceral Part connection with it. Yeah. yeah, 
And it, it was, it was part of the, the, the actual performance. So I sort of switched over and we, you right. know, this is still, it still works, but it per, primarily I wanted to go more to a pedal board kind of right. environment. So. And you got some um, fun stuff hiding in here. Oh yeah, there's, that. there's always, you know, actually yeah. there's a couple of cool things here. Well, actually, oh, is that another rat. Um, where is it? It's somewhere in here. Hold on. Oh yeah. Remember this old one? I have one. Yeah, I, I, I love it. Yeah, but you see how dusty it is. It hadn't, oh. been, hadn't been touched since the early fifties. Like, you know, I like this. Yeah. yeah, but so yeah, I mean, there's endless sort of, but that was the idea of just having right. endless pedals and endless yeah. amps and endless everything. So, the, the the idea was always, the only limitation, right. was our brains. Right. You know, because we can get or have everything you've ever dreamed of and it's right here or it's a phone call away. And then, uh, well, actually, it's kind of un unassuming over there, but uh, I just scored the new uh, Rob Zombie film. Oh, you and, did? Yeah, yeah. Congrats. And John, John Five and I did it together. And uh, so that's our essentially our film you know, that's a whole other computer system wow. based on, you know, sound design and every possible sound what you've ever you dreamed of. Uh, what, actually, what I'm doing is I'm just simply running <laughs> right into the patch bay. And I'm, so I'm using the, um, uh, I'm using the uh, PC. It's a PC computer. Oh, wow. Because normally everything I have is Mac. Sure. All of our home stuff and, you know, right. laptops and everything is Mac. That's the only PC that we let in our property. We just have, we just have that <laughs> only one. we let in yeah, the property. We, yeah, right. it's like generally if you come over and you bring a PC, oh, sorry, you're going to have to go home. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's like, so we have one PC. That is a and, joke for those. And, no, right, no, yeah, no need to comment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no brutality, just kidding. Uh, then we have that, uh, the uh, interface there, and then it comes to the audio card there, and, and that puts us into a stereo pair nice. there. And then we just run it through there. Eventually, I want to go to Ethernet to go right. straight in, but I just haven't gotten Little there works. yet. Yeah, so it's like the list is keeps getting longer all the right. time. Well, as I was saying, that is still one of the most important things and about keeping myself always contemporary, always right. on the front edge. Because it starts with just the psyche of, seeing new music and seeing new kids with new ideas and going, oh, man, that's really cool. And mm -hmm. learning, you know, understanding it, being able to get it here. Sure. And then about understanding the technology of how we get there. You know, for instance, like being able to do, you know, uh, essentially, you know, EDM if I wanted to, you know, because it's like about having the ability and technology to be able to do anything that we want to do. Hey, you some know. of the most successful EDM guys are actually about 50 years old. And I know. Is David it, Guetta, I believe, yeah. is 48. I, I was going to say, that's part of the deal is just, you know. But the thing is, is that, that, that like, for instance, my personal feeling is that some, some of the new EDM that's coming out is amazing. Mm -hmm. Because it's just like this new sonic landscape. It isn't like, you know, it's yeah. not all that kind of, It's like these amazing, slow, beautiful, sure. textural things that are like, God, that's cool, you know. Yeah. So that's, I'm, you know, being influenced by all of that. And, but as all things, I'm, it's never one thing. It's mm -hmm. just everything. You know, it's life. It's being able to look around and go, ooh, cool, you know, mm -hmm. and then make music about it, you know. Yeah, so. that's wonderful. There you go. That's amazing. Okay. Well, oh. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. It's great to hang out with you. My pleasure. And it's great to sort of, I don't know, it's great to see this place again. And I feel like next time I'm tracking guitars, I just have to come over and hang out with you. Well, you are more than welcome. Everybody's welcome. You got that. <laughs> Everybody's welcome. It's a wonderful place. I hope you guys had a wonderful time. Please, as ever, leave tons of questions and comments below. I will try and hit him up if there's any specific questions and get some answers to it as well. Thank you ever so much for watching and have a marvelous time recording.